Hello and welcome to The Drum Show, powered by Disruptive Live, a new series looking at the big talking points in media and marketing each week. I'm Stephen Leftai, editor of The Drum, and joining me on the couch this week to, to take a look behind the headlines, we have uh, influencer Emily Roberts, who is also known as The Lipstick Fever on Instagram, Lucy Robertson from influencer business Scene Connects, and Andrew Cantor, who runs the Branded Content Market Marketing Association. But first, let's quickly talk about some of the stories that have been making headlines this week. Her outfit is totally inappropriate. Whatever. Do you know nothing, Jon Snow? They're not real athletes. No. The man's got sausage fingers. So first up this week, Channel 4 has hit back at viewer complaints with a star-studded ad that brings to life some of the bizarre but genuine criticisms it's received this year. Featuring talents like news presenter Jon Snow and Countdown's Rachel Riley, the tongue-in-cheek spot has been widely praised for taking on the trolls. It was developed in-house by 4Creative, which wanted to show how the broadcaster was set up to provoke debate and take risks. If you have anything to add, you can send your gripes to complaintswelcome at channel4.co.uk. We all know the ad industry loves a moan. Elsewhere, publicist, publicist group spending spree has continued with the acquisition of US marketing agency Roxa. I think that's how it's uh, said, for an undisclosed sum. With 320 staff and clients including Samsung, Vans and Verizon, Roxa was the industry's largest independent women-owned agency. It will continue to be led by founder Jill uh, Gualte and President Gina Smith in its new home at Publis Publicis Media. The deal comes just a month after Publicis closed its 4.4 billion buyout of the data company Epsilon. And in other news involving Publicis, Mondelez has chosen the French holding company and its long-standing adversary WPP to jointly handle its global advertising business. The snacks giant has previously worked with a plethora of agencies including IPG, Dentsu and Havas but said it now wanted to streamline its roster in the hope of improving digital ROI. Digitas will be the lead agency for Publicis, while Ogilvy and its sister agency, David, will do the honours for WPP. A select number of other outside agencies will continue to work with Mondelez Brands, including BCCP, and uh, that has kept the Cadbury account in the UK. Now, let's talk to our guests about some of the stories that have caught their eye this week. So thank you for joining us, first of all. Uh, Andrew, can I ask what story uh, caught your eye and why? Thank you, Stephen. Yes, this was uh, the mystery of the influencer and the Instagram motorcycle accident. Apparently, it was the most beautiful motorcycle accident ever taking place. This is a, an influencer called Tiffany Mitchell, who's actually based in Nashville, was riding her bike and she, unfortunately she came off. But the photographs that were published on Instagram, mm. apparently uh, they've been seen to be uh, staged. And actually there was a bottle of smart water in the photos as well. So there's been a real issue around. I mean, mm. Tiffany uh, does say that the accident was genuine. Um, and there's, there's been a bit of a backlash really in terms of whether these were genuine or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's really the issue now because, you know, in the early days of social media, the, the reason why influencers were so, were so powerful is that they were normal people. Mm -hmm. They were just telling stuff uh, you know, in an everyday sense. Now, this is really coming into question now about is it real or is it not? So I, I think it's one of those ones that sort of captures the, the attention and is really interesting in terms of how we're kind of, it's, it, the, the space is evolving. And I think we'll probably pick up on that uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, what's, what's your next story? Um, so more on influencer extremes. So basically a deep dive was released this week into the subscription-based website OnlyFans. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I hadn't heard of it before this week. But basically influencers can sign up and so can their fans. Their fans can pay up to $20 to $25 a week to basically access X-rated content of the influencers. So 
anything from the slightly risque, so a topless photo maybe of someone working out, to full-on pornography of these influencers. Mm. I went and had a little look a couple of days ago, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in a non-creepy way, oh, and wow. I was, uh, I didn't sign up, no. <laughs> and I was, I was quite surprised to see a couple of influencers I've actually worked with um, in the past, our members on here, so. I think it kind of poses the question like where do we draw the line now you know people are doing daily vlogs they're showing up to hours of their day already online we've kind of gone from like friend me on facebook like my instagram watch my daily vlog to pay 25 dollars a month to watch me have sex i mean where do we draw the line i think given the behaviors of gen z the fact that they like prefer to have these kind of private clandestine conversations they have finsters which are basically fake instants so they have their main instagram account and then they actually have a fake Instagram account, which is private, and that shows their real self. So they're almost keeping that part of themselves kind of concealed, essentially. They're keeping something private. They're keeping something offline. Do we now start going backwards? Have we reached the peak? If you can pay to view the most private thing possible, where do we go from here? I, I, I would guess we're going to find out. I guess oh. we're going to find out. Yeah. Hopefully not branded content on OnlyFans. Oh, it'll come. It'll come. <laughs> um, Emma, what was yours? Um, on a, a less extreme note, um, something that caught my eye this week was um, an article that was highlighting college students as influencers and these crazy high engagement rates, or I suppose as you guys call them, university students. Mm -hmm. um, so they're highlighting their engagement rates, were, were, which were upwards of 25%. And to put that in perspective, like in my world, influencers have you know, an engagement rate median, I would say, of like, you know, anywhere from two to five percent, yeah. depending on what tier of influencer you are. So I just thought it was so interesting to think about this next wave of influencers that are going to come around, um, you know, what kind of influence they're going to have, um, how that's going to kind of impact the landscape. Um, and a lot of them are pursuing social media influence or kind of on the side of what they're pursuing as a career. So I think it'll be interesting to see, like, are these college students looking to become social media superstars or do they see it as a way of life and are they going to kind of go down both paths? So let's talk a bit more about uh, what influencers actually mean to the advertising industry then. Um, let's start with yourself. When you're working with, with uh, clients and, and brands, what is it you are personally bringing to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've been doing this for four years now, um, and I started working with brands very early on, so kind of in the, in the first year. Um, and I feel like my clients and brands that I work with come to me because they know that they're going to get high quality content. Um, so from the beginning, I, I made sure that um, you know high res images was my focus, um, and I would always deliver on that um, that high quality content. Um, in addition, consistency. So um, I have a, a background in digital media, so um, I'm pretty used to reading a brief and understanding like what a client's goals are. And I think as an influencer, that is so crucial. Um, so to have that background has been really helpful. Um, so consistency, and then I think the last one, it might sound simple, but professionalism. Mm -hmm. So just simply being responsive with your brands and your clients, um, delivering on the assets, um, and just and being responsive, I think it goes such a long way. Um, being buttoned up, being organized, um, and then following up after a campaign. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think we wipe our hands clean and we move on to the next campaign, but I think it's really important to take the time to um, make sure that you're delivering on, on results. And what are, the, what are the metrics and what are the results that you tend to be asked for or that you, yeah. you show? So right now, I feel like it's all about views, story views. So if I am delivering on an Instagram post or a carousel um, or even a video, um, the brands can see all of the engagement. They can hop on Instagram or they usually have their own third party platform that they're using. They can see all those metrics. I don't necessarily have to deliver them. Often I will, um, just as an add-on, I'll do like a campaign wrap-up report, just like a one sheet and show them all the metrics. Um, they always ask for story views because they can't see those. So screenshots of story views. Um, before a campaign, they might ask for a screenshot of my Instagram analytics and my demo and those numbers. Um, so those are sort of the, the main things. But what I try to do with clients is show them something they can't see. So that's usually story views and then uh, saves. So you can save an Instagram post and check on it later. Say if someone posts a recipe or something, you want to refer back to it. Um, so saves and then direct messages. So like how many messages did I get from somebody? Mm -hmm. Maybe a huge influencer um, saw my post and was like, oh my God, where can I buy this? Um, I need to know. Um, screenshotting that, sending it to the brand. So just providing additional value, I think will like really set you apart. 
And, and Andrew, what is it your members, I mean, what is it brands are specifically looking for when, when they talk about going to influencers? I know this is something that uh, the association is moving into more. So what is it you're hearing? Well, I think, you know, Emily's point is so um, important because they, they want to understand what the effect, how effective these campaigns are. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you take it right back to the, to the beginning of sort of advertising, word of mouth has always been the most powerful way of selling a product. And that's what influencers uh, can do. But it, I think it's about authenticity as well in terms of that, um, in, you know, engagement for the brand. And I think, you know, brands, you know, tend to want to do the shiny new thing. We know that. And, but I think it's about looking at the, the, the strategic framework. Why are you actually doing this? You know, what problem is it solving? I think there was a, a, a report this week that said Estee Lauder now is spending 75% of their marketing budget on influencer marketing. Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. And obviously it must be working, otherwise yeah. why are they doing it? So yeah. what we're doing as an organization is professionalizing the industry using best practice. You know, what we've done for branded content over the last 15, 16 years is what we're now bringing into influencer marketing because I, I believe the brands want that in terms of measurement, effectiveness, and looking at what they should be doing in this area. And, I mean, we'll see, Syn Synconex is uh, an influencer agency, yeah. but where do you think that sits within the marketing mix? Is it PR, is it social media? What, what is influencing? It's an age old question. I'm gonna look at it a couple of different ways. So there's data and there's content. So a social media team are gonna be so used to kind of running tests, looking at the results. They know exactly what to look for in terms of the type of content that's gonna resonate well with their brand's audience. Mm -hmm. And this is a real case by case basis as well, because it can go from like the really low fi to the really high production value. So for example, a brand like Bumble, the stuff that performs best for them is literally someone sitting with their iPhone, doing a live stream, doing an IGTV. It's raw, it's unedited, it's completely authentic. Like mm -hmm. you say, that's super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Then you have a brand like Panasonic, right? Lumix cameras. The end result has to be so flash. It has to be super slick. It has to be super high production. It has to sell the camera's capabilities. So that team is going to be on the lookout for whatever is going to resonate best with the audience. Mm -hmm. But then there's the data side of things as well. So I feel like a social media team is so kind of... They're in the back end of all these pages. They're measuring against KPIs week on week in terms of the brand's content from like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it might be. They need to be able to look at an influencer's insights and say, ah, okay, how do those match up to our KPIs? And it's different every time, right? There's no one size fits all. So if you're an app, is it cost per acquisition? If you're doing an event, is it like cost per engagement or engagement rate? You know, there's different kinds of metrics of success and you have to make sure they're different every time so that they're fitting the brand's needs. When it comes to a PR team, I do think it's more around that placement and that exposure and that kind of mass, mass awareness. But no matter how many eyes are on something, it's like, okay, but what's the action that's taken as a result of that? Do they then go and buy the product? Do they then download the app? That's the kind of missing piece for me. And that's the bit where the analytical side of a social media team really comes in. Well, I mean, we know this is, this is a sector that's going to continue to grow and grow. And, and we're seeing acquisitions of influencers focused businesses happening right now. But there's still so much skepticism around it all as well. And I mean, you highlighted earlier on a potential crash that we're not even sure if it was staged or not what needs to happen to try and overcome that skepticism what do you what do you each feel needs to come into to influencing before we, we lose that to me it's about demonstrating the effectiveness it's about you know who, who's doing it brilliantly where are the case studies you know where is the learning i always say you learn more from stuff that doesn't work than stuff that does but you know where is where is that sort of you know resource and that's really what we're aiming to do is pull all that data together you know what is influencer marketing what, what's the definition of it you know you can ask 10 people you'll get 10 different answers again this is a uh, some work that, that needs to be done we're now looking with the academic um, world to, to look at that you mentioned the college students as well mm -hmm. you know they're, they're, we're now putting together a qualification for influencer marketing a CPD this is what it's about this is really where I believe we need to, to, to get to in terms of the industry because you know your point is there everyone needs something different exactly. but i think you need to understand what you need yeah. <laughs> in the yeah, first exactly. instance so um, that that would be where i i think we should be heading okay. i mean yeah we know it's it's going to continue to grow it was a two billion dollar industry in 2017 it's set to be a 10 billion dollar industry by next year which is crazy i think for me it's it's around two things it's measuring success and being able to prove roi i think 
you know, it's all well and good to get an influencer to an event or to get them to really quickly post about a product, but what's the long game here? Like, I think using people as an extension of your brand team, as an extension of your creative team, because that's what they are, they're content creators. You're using them for their audience, but you're also using them for their content creating abilities. So it's thinking about the long game, how do we use them across platforms in different ways as spokespeople for the brand? I think also we need to start considering the behaviors of the next generation that are going to become consumers as well. Your example of the like perfectly placed water in the middle of this accident. I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And I think the next generation, they're super smart to that stuff and they hate it. They hate exactly. it. It needs to be dialed yeah. back and it needs to feel real and authentic. And you know, it, it sounds so stupid, but people just need to actually use the product mm -hmm. as well. You'd be so surprised at the amount of brands where it's like, right, okay, one hit, let's get them talking about this product. They do a video on it end of relationship. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't drive any ROI. You need to see a piece of branded content 11 times before you convert. I think some of the issues are, sorry if I, you know, to, to, to jump in, but it's, a, it's often seen as you know, an add-on. It's often seen, oh, well, look, yeah. you know, we've done the campaign, we've got the big TVC, we've got a bit of content, let's get the influencer involved. Well, no. Yeah. Do it right at the beginning. You know, integrate. You know, this is what we need to do. This is what you know, we were doing 15 years ago with branded content. Oh, it's a nice thing. No, it's got to be integral to what you're doing. And, and I absolutely what we've always said about social media, about PR. It's always been, you know, it's always been last, last we thought. All, we always tend to overcomplicate exactly. it, yeah, and I don't yeah. think we need to. Yeah. Last word. Yeah, my hope, I completely agree with all your points too, and my hope is that both sides of the industry are starting to mature. I feel like it's starting to happen now. So the brands and agencies are they're getting smarter, they're asking the right questions, um, they're coming up with goals, they're doing longer term campaigns rather than a one-off we go our separate ways. Um, and then on the other side, the influencer side, um, we're also getting more professional, we're getting older, um, we're getting more buttoned up. So my hope is that it's going in that direction. Um, and then there's this whole other issue and probably saved for another um, segment, but fake followers. So mm -hmm. that's a massive issue. And so my hope is with the maturity of the industry, kind of the fallback of the influencers that don't actually have real influence will just fall to the wayside yeah. because it is exactly. so yeah. a little bit overwhelming right now with the amount of content creators yeah. out there. So that's kind of where I'm kind of hoping. Interesting. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I do suspect that is something we will continue to cover here at The Drum, Thanks. but that, that was great to hear your thoughts. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. If there's one thing we all hate in this business, it's jargon. Each week, we'll be asking one industry luminary to share their bullshit buzzwords that they'd love to banish from the industry. So first up, here's WPP's Global Transformation uh, Chief, Lindsay Patterson. I'm Lindsay Patterson and my bullshit buzzword is paradigm shift, or is that two words? Every day, the Drum website shares the world's best uh, new advertising and design work on our dedicated platform, Creative Works. You can even post your own work there for the world to enjoy. Our readers will then vote on the projects they like the most to crown our work of the week. So let's take a look at who has that honour this week. Hinge wants you to meet someone great. Even if it kills us. Because when you find the real thing, you won't need us anymore. Which is kind of the point. Hinge, the dating app designed to be deleted. So as you've seen, this week's Work of the Week winner is Hinge with the dating app designed to be deleted, uh, created by Red Antler in the US. So if you want to see more work, please go to the Drums Creative Works uh, section and vote for your favourite work, submit your work as well, and maybe you could be seeing your work as Work of the Week next week. So finally, here is an overview of what's coming up over the next seven days in the world of the drum. The deadline to enter the Drum Out of Home Awards and the Drum Advertising Awards will fall next week with both ceremonies aiming to celebrate the best work taking place in each sector. 
More details can be found about both on the awards section of the DRUM website homepage. Tickets are also on sale for the London Annual Conference Pitch Perfect, which aims to help agencies source new business and learn how to improve their working relationships with clients. The event will be held at Atmospheres on 20th of November, with the agendas of speakers due to be announced imminently. More details can be found on pitchperfect.drum.ly. And the latest issue of the Drum Magazine has been released, taking an in-depth look behind the camera to consider what is next for the world of television and for new screens, new viewers, content breakthroughs, and what that all means for advertisers. So you can buy a copy or subscribe to receive your copy through the Drum, the Drum Inc. part of the Drum website or by downloading the mobile app. And that's all we have time for this week. So do join us every Friday at the same time, for more media marketing insights from The Drum Show. Take care.